grace to you and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One of the most tragic things that I experience in my time and service as a pastor is to see families who within their own family get crossways with each other. And you, many of you who are older, have probably seen this before. The last parent passes away. And the siblings fight and argue and become bitter and enraged over how the property is going to be divided, be it money or stocks and bonds or land or whatever. And a once loving family, at least on by appearances, are now seemingly enemies with each other. You see it happen so you can understand the story I'm beginning with. There were two brothers whose father had died and left them quite a large inheritance in land and resources. And the two brothers in the division of the property they got really angry with each other. And you know what I'm talking about, the kind of anger I'm talking about, where if you're walking down the sidewalk in a small town and you see your brother coming towards you, you go across the street and down the other sidewalk to avoid them. When you pass each other on the road, you look the other way instead of waiting. That kind of ingrained bitterness and anger that severs relationships. The two farms that dad had given them were joined together by a beautiful meadow. A rolling, slumbering meadow joined the two pieces of land, and one brother could look across the meadow and see the other brother's house. The older of the two brothers took a bulldozer and cut a large ravine right through the center of the meadow, diverting the small creek and creating an impassable barrier between the two pieces of property. What once had been beautiful, a symbol of union and beauty, was now scarred and marred and was destroyed. Because now there was this huge, destructive division right in the midst of the meadow that used to be so beautiful. Well, the other brother was enraged. Every day he would look out his living room window and see this huge gash in the earth. And his anger would be boil. One day, a traveling carpenter came by, knocked on the farmer's door, and says, I'm just a carpenter. I'm looking for some work. Do you have anything I can do? The farmer thought for a moment and said, Absolutely, I do. He put him in the truck and took him out right to the edge of the, the new creek and said, You see this creek here? My brother did that. I want you to build a wall. I want you to build a wall so tall that when I'm in my living room and looking out, I can't even see this creek or see my brother's property. I never want to see it again. So he took him into town, filled his truck with lumber, bought all the supplies he needed, took him out and dumped it all right there beside this big creek. And went on about his business. At the end of the day, came back to check what kind of work had been done. And he was astonished to find out the carpenter had not built a wall at all. But in fact, he'd taken all the lumber and built a bridge across the creek. The other brother, having seen what was happening, comes down and sees the bridge and walks out into the middle of the bridge, thinking his brother had done this intentionally. The first brother went out on the bridge, and the two men face to face and spoke for the first time in years. And on that bridge, reconciliation took place. They found that the anger they had had vanished because of the gesture, the overture, that one wanted to heal the vision, even though it was God on the screen over them. Happy and rejoicing and celebrating the fact they had union in the relationship again, they went over to the carpenter who was loading his tools up in the box, saying it was time for him to go. And the two brothers said, no, if you stay, we have more work you can do. The carpenter said, no, my work here's done. There are other bridges that need to be built. You see, the idea of building a bridge is an appropriate image for us when we talk about what God has done and His love for us. You see, there was a time when we were in beautiful fellowship with God, when there was union and joy and happiness, when we were, in a sense, a family. We were His children. And then something happened. Sin became a reality because of our own rebellion. And what was once and beautiful was destroyed and marred. And there was a division that took place that was deep and ugly and impassable. And so God chose 
to bridge that division. He chose a simple carpenter. And a carpenter who would use three iron nails and a couple of pieces of rough cut lumber. A carpenter who would build a bridge over the separation, over the division that grieved the Father so much. To make it possible for us to once again be reconciled to the God who loves us. The passage that I had read, I had Aaron read for us. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we through him might become the righteousness of God. It's a passage that is, is I don't know if we can really plumb the depths of it. I, mean, I don't know about you, but I think about Jesus hanging on the cross, taking all the sins of all the people in the whole world upon himself. That's more than my little finite mind can understand. I think about it. All the people of history, all the people alive today, and all the people who will ever live, all their sin, Jesus took to himself all at the same time. I can't truly plumb the depths of what that means or imagine the enormity of that. If you can, you're a much deeper thinker than I am. But I know myself. It's like you know yourself. And it is in those quiet moments when we are all alone, when it's just me and God, or you and God, and you reflect over your life and you look at yourself as a word in the mirror and you see all that you have done. You see the pain that it has caused, the division, the ugliness, the ugly scar has left. When you see the reality of what your sin is, it is in that you can turn to Jesus. It's then you can turn to Jesus on the cross and find that there God was bridging the gap. Where Jesus came into this world as a simple carpenter. He really was a carpenter, guys. And he lived in simplicity, but he saw the hurt and the heartache and the division and the separation. And in fact, the hatred of God by so many people. People who spurned God and rejected Him, even though time and time again God had extended the invitation saying, I want a relationship with you. People would turn and walk away. They were angry with God, like the two brothers who wouldn't even acknowledge each other in the room. But God kept coming. Through all of history, God kept coming with an invitation and overture that He wants to heal the relationship. But it was impossible for any of us to go back to God because that division was there. Sin is real. Then with those three nails and two pieces of wood, Jesus took our sins upon himself and bridged the separation so that we could once again be made whole and one of our Father. That's what Lent is about. Lent is a penitential season, a season in which we realize and focus on what it cost God to save me. The price Jesus paid so that I might be reconciled with my Father. So that what separated me from God could be restored and made whole. I think most of you have had been to college, and maybe some of the high school students have heard of Elizabeth Barrett, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, you know who she is? A very well-known author. What you may not know about her is that because of an accident when she was just a young girl, she was left kind of semi like an invalid. Was had very cha difficult challenges in her life. She was hovered over by a tyrannical father, a very mean man. He controlled every aspect of her life. She met and fell in love with Robert Browning. But the father, his father, absolutely disapproved of him. Rejected any offer made. He would not want his daughter seeing this man at all. So the marriage was conducted in secret without her father knowing that. Immediately, they boarded a ship and headed to Paris where they would spend the rest of their lives together. The response of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's father and mother absolutely disowned her. Literally cut her out of the will. Okay? Their daughter was dead to them. And yet, in Paris, 
Each week that went by, Elizabeth Barrett Brown would write a letter, put it in the post, and send it to her parents. She did that for 10 years. One day, she received a box in the mail. Inside that box were 10 years' worth of letters unopened. They would not even consider. How often does that happen? How often does it happen that, that the one who is, has done nothing wrong, because Elizabeth Barrett Browning did nothing wrong, she fell in love, she was an adult, she had a right to marry. She did nothing wrong, yet she's the one who makes the overture of reconciliation. What would have happened if her parents had opened those letters and read a few of them and found in their own heart love for their daughter? But they spurned every opportunity. That's why the Apostle Paul in our text is say, it is as if God is making his appeal through us be reconciled to God. You see, God did nothing wrong. He was perfect in every way, and yet he's the one who extends the invitation, who makes the overture of reconciliation by sending his son Jesus into the world to suffer and die for us. And then he comes to us over and over and over again, saying, I'm here for you, and I love you, and I want you to be reconciled to me. It's we who stubbornly resist. It's we who stubbornly reject his overture of reconciliation. Sometimes we're stubborn. Sometimes we, we turn a blind eye to our own need. And yet God never fails to offer over and over again. And so I would tell you tonight, as we begin this little journey together, hear the voice of God Himself. Jesus who walked the earth as God in human flesh. Jesus who never sinned, but became sin for us. He says, I love you. He says, I want you. He says, I've made it possible for you to be reconciled to myself and my Father. Accept the invitation Jesus gives. Meet your God on the bridge of the cross and find the forgiveness and the life He wants you to have. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus' name, in the life of the Lord, our peace.